let's begin. So for our agenda today, I will start with explaining our BI responsibilities in the baseball world, then our partnership with Google and the business value. I will then provide two examples of our production data fusion delivery and finally go over our goals in the future. MLB BI, that's our team. So I wanted to let it render there. I wanted to level set the conversation on what we do. What you see here is a number of recognizable areas under the MLB umbrella that most of our fans and customers are familiar with. MLB TV is our subscription-based audio, our subscription-based audio and video platform where customers can watch MLB games live, an amazing product, MLB Network, and as award-winning sports channel, producing amazing baseball content. I'm also showing a sliver of other products on the right here that are primarily centrally managed and or delivered out of the commissioner's office. MLB tickets, uh, the ballpark app, and even video games like RBI Baseball. So we don't do any of that on the enterprise side. And I find it easier to explain to folks what we do not do than all that we do do. Even prior to our initiatives of One Baseball to bring all business arms of the league under one roof, we on the enterprise side have always worked on delivering solutions for our customers. Who are our customers? We are in service to the game and to the clubs. Our enterprise area touches all other equally important initiatives and processes in baseball. Um, and my team supports those areas in one or all the services listed here. To rattle off some of the systems or areas, EBIS, our electronic baseball information system that facilitates many functions of baseball operations for the 30 major league clubs and the Office of Commissioners, PIA, an application built in-house with the purpose of providing a powerful player comparison tool for arbitration. It is the only application that marries the contract, service, and transactional data from our EBIS platform with all the statistical data captured by BAM. Play Ball, inspiring everyone to play ball, an initiative centered around growing our game through youth participation. But we're not limited to just those. These are pro there are projects, All-Star, Draft, and Umpire, for those who are fans of the game that we touch. But baseball is an enterprise like many others that have accounting, human resources, and communications group that also have analytical needs. Trust me when I say there are too many areas and products to mention, and our team support a lot of hardworking, talented individuals who have an equal hand in making the game as great as it is today. So MLB and, and Google. In 2020, we announced our uh, cloud partnership with Google. And the statement that some may overlook here is the inclusion of the opportunity we got to upgrade our business processes in this relationship, which is what we're gonna talk about today. So those business processes support those areas I mentioned earlier. We are a data-driven shop, and my team of data professionals assist the commissioner's office initiatives in providing analytical and reporting insight for the 30 clubs across various internally built and maintained platforms across multiple departments. Data Fusion has shown immediate success in providing a platform for my lean team to leverage delivery solutions across the enterprise that scale along with the business. In the two examples I'm gonna go over that are in production today, I will show the reduced complexity, increased transparency, while modernizing our practice and limiting business disruption. My first example, we'll talk about stats at volume with speed. So I think it's important to level set on a process maybe not known by all our attendees in support of arbitration, which is what happens if the player if the club and player have not agreed on a salary by a deadline in mid-January, the club and player must exchange salary figures for the upcoming season. If no settlement can be reached by the hearing date, the case is brought before a panel of arbiters. After hearing arguments from both sides, the panel selects either the salary figure of either the player or the club, but not one in between. Unfortunately, this is, unfortunately, not unfortunately, sorry. As you can imagine, that is a very impactful process that involves a lot of data marrying of contracts and stats. Our StatCast system is arguably the most robust system in the world, and we fortunately get to tap into that. Unfortunately, 
this is a very large data set to traverse. Historically, because of our business is baseball games, West Coast games could go to 3, 4 a.m. Eastern, if you're lucky. And we have a target SLA to get the analysis into our downstream dependence and systems by 9 a.m. effectively. To that end, we would perform our typical batch processes of loading only the change data from our stat system into our warehouse and then feed our MPP database for consumption. This would take four to five hours to complete where we would search among very wide and deep tables of varying data types. Take what was new or changed and leverage a third party CDC process to assist in identifying what to delete, update, et cetera. There was tuning done prior to my arrival at MOB years ago to get it down to this time. And when, they were, when there were recalcs in the source system, like the stats, we needed to work with those business partners that are downstream to adjust expectations for increased time. Now with GCP and data fusion, as well as BigQuery, we were able to modernize this process. We attempted to integrate our API collection with our previous ETL2, but it choked. Adding time was not an option. What you see here is something we were able to do in parallel because of data fusion. We have removed our reliance on CDC and moved all of the data at once. This reduces our reliance on constantly having to depend on a CDC change ca data capture product that has failed in the past because of networking or other unplanned issues. We're able to move data from our A database to BigQuery and have that sit alongside our modernized API process to test and deliver a future resistant, I won't say future proof, as we in the tech industry can understand, stats delivery process at scale. We develop pipelines one at a time that will eventually replace our historical process entirely. With this integration, we are seamlessly able to turn off one stream and turn on another when the time is right. Our reduced dependency on that database via the historical process is now in our control. We are moving currently 650 rec million records from the database in under two hours daily. Now an assumption may be that we have that doing half the load, 650 millions approximately, so it should take half the time, but not exactly because we are, it, we are in total bound by the longest running pipeline. Before we were only moving the data that changed around. So that 1 billion in relation to time included sourcing, searching for the data among the 1 billion records in the database. That wasn't that fast. Now, because of the varying compute engines spun up from data fusion, each worker node organizes its subsets of records to manage the process all in parallel. Now in under two hours, now I said under two hours, but in reality, it's a max of two hours. If you see from our summary image provided by data fusion on the bottom right, that previous two hour job in yellow usually takes closer to 45 minutes to run. And in total, all pipelines concurrently would be finished in, a, in about an hour total. But we recently pushed our time back for some testing of other items, and it's possible we are now butting up against database congestion. But this helps us investigate with infrastructure owners of that DB to determine what the best solution would be. And this is provided in the data fusion interface. So that's one example. And now uh, I talked about volume and speed, but I would like to also give an example of precision with coordination. Our royalties business generate revenue for the 30 clubs. Our marks are known around the world and the use of these marks in association to any brand who uses them pay royalties. The organization of that entire process workflow is centralized for the most part through a department here in a major league baseball. As with any business, we are looking for opportunities to grow our business. And what I'm showing you here is a high level model of that system. Our historical process would have an app that manages the contracts in purple and an app that collects the data in red. The business needed to add another app in the process. And this posed a perfect opportunity for us to leverage data fusion to evolve our entire process efficiently. The lift would have been huge via our previous ETL process. Now with our current process, we are able to use data fusion to land our data in BigQuery 
and serve the data out to downstream systems without all the complexity. We have created transparency as the code isn't locked in a proprietary system. It is now in a browser. The flow is simpler through mod modularization where we could add apps without major data surgery. We've performed that before. And in the end, we can take this whole process with us anywhere. Why? Because we are now more self-reliant than ever before. The CDAP product is open source and we can stand up an instance on any cloud infrastructure we want. I did mention earlier, we built for future resistance. The GUI interface for Data Fusion is very approachable. And I plan to get more folks on my team, as well as teams in close proximity with ours, data stewards, to get comfortable using our instance for their data. The platform allows my team to scale with the business through rapid development without having to worry or be mindful of infrastructure. Tomorrow, we need to take 2 billion records or 20,000. We do it in the same space. We're not thinking about time and load and space and all that kind of stuff. That's all managed. If our long-term partnership with Google ends, the lift isn't as massive as we literally can take our ball and go home because the platform is agnostic to Google. It's open source and the pipelines are ours. Now looking into the future. Data fusion isn't without its issues, okay? We are growing together with Google and to their credit, emblematic of the open source spirit, Google is open to resolving our needs. We are pushing them to prioritize development for an even more managed service. So I'm gonna go through here on the blue, um, disaster recovery. I had an issue at 1 a.m. And I will say it was one time in over a year that I had an issue uh, on an infrastructure related problem that could have been resolved much easier if the ecosystem around disaster recovery was more developed. To Google's credit, we got the issue resolved within an hour. I hit my SLAs with the business users and they didn't even know. So now I'm exposing myself a little bit here. Upgrading, we have to upgrade, we've had to upgrade through this process a number of times and that process can and I'm sure will be better. Logging, another process that can take great st strides in improvement and integration. And I, again, you know, to Google's credit, we're working hand in hand and they're very receptive to you know, doing their part um, to make that work. Dashboards, I will say in the recent release 6.4, it went in a direction that I think can be better. And again, you know, they're, they're open to that. Now, SDLC optimization, GitHub, this is one of the greatest areas of improvement that I think will accelerate our velocity. Currently, I have one of my data engineers um, working on a process and doing that essentially ourselves and having to go through three separate API calls for scheduling of a pipeline alone is more than we would really want to own. Artifact management and plugin versions are all areas of improvement that again, you know, through this API, they give you the tools, but for a lean team, I'm looking for a managed opportunity. And again, I think I want to stress us moving and whatnot is still in our control. And I think we could take that with us. It's just the platform, right? Is gonna be able to be upgraded in that manner. But the integration and managed services is an excellent opportunity. Google Sheets, uh, we wanna bring the business into the workflow, giving them ownership of pieces and enabling them only helps us unlock potential. Which leads into the last items where we are seeing if there are self-service opportunities um, integrating and hooking into other tools. Um, we've been able to do scheduling and triggering and things of that nature, but we wanna, again, empower our users, empower our community internally in the enterprise and give them you know, more power. So we're looking at how to better leverage the microservices available and um, do the self-service opportunities and investigate all those plugins that I had showed you guys earlier, um, seeing what else that we can do there. So that's it. And uh, thank you all for listening. You know, uh, hopefully I was able to give perspective into the game, talk about the data capabilities and business value our lean team um, implements with Data Fusion. Perfect. Thank you, Charles. You know, uh, as the questions uh, as the questions are coming in, uh, let me ask you. You know, just one question on this: How long did this journey take for you from the time? you know, the cloud data fusion, you made a decision and the team made a decision and then 
uh, uh, the journey itself, you know, and then the second question I had was scale. I know, you know, you are probably processing, you know, billions and billions of records, you know, how, what is the scale? Can you give us some insight on that? Sure. I will say that the initial learning curve, because, you know, CDAP and Data Fusion, um, marketing wise, we were looking for an open source product. And um, fortunately, we have the Google Cloud partnership. So I was able to, you know, see within the tool sets of what's available. So, you know, I had to ramp up on what the offering was. But I will say from after learning and doing our first pipeline, I could see the power. So once we were able to get, you know, networking, as everybody knows, you have to get through the right rights and all that kind of stuff. Once you get through all of those things, I mean, it. I would say maybe four weeks, somewhere four or eight weeks necessarily to, and I say that long tail because you're doing a lot of testing and whatnot, but you get faster as you get used to what pipelines is and what's going on here and there. So, you know, that's really where once your comfortability gets to it, you know, if somebody comes, what I feel comfortable with now is if somebody comes to me with like, hey, I need to move data from A to B, we can do it fairly quickly. So that's after getting used to that. Now, in terms of what you're saying about processing, you know, I have different um, tools that I use to monitor, you know, rows and records that are going across. And, you know, in total, it's well over a billion records per day um, across the different products. That's, again, umpires. Um, and I'm talking in very general terms here. Stats, umpire data, you know, our royalties data. Like you could think about the intricacies of some of those systems. You know, I talked about two versus three and adding all of those systems that need to feed other systems. Um, but in total, well over a billion. And then when you think about that per day, and then you're thinking about like in under an hour, you know, it's like, you know, this is where I will say that the conversations I have with my, you know, data engineering team, like, and, and again, I've been in this business for 10 years plus, um, previously you had to talk about like, how big is that? You know, what do you have to think about? You had to think about that. We don't think about that anymore. You know, I think that that's really the relief. We don't think about the infrastructure. We don't, you know, the, outside of that one time, um, you know, I will say that we, we sleep a little bit better knowing that, you know, the, 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 the compute profiles are spun up and de 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 deleted. So in a sense, you've inherently created a repeatable process, right? Because the compute profiles spin up and do the work. So you don't have to necessarily worry as much that this VM is a problem. So inherently you have a solution that you can sleep well at night knowing as long as it spins up, it goes through. So, you know, we don't think about the data anymore. We just think about what are we delivering? What is what is the time frame needed for the business? You know, and that's where we're going to sort of work with businesses that need real time versus batch because I'm a very big proponent of not everything needs to be real time. You don't have to do that. So, let's do batch for where we need it, real time where we need it, and that's the evolution that we're going to take. That is awesome. Thank you, Charles. Another question that you know one of our audience members is asking is, would you consider Airflow or Composer? Um, you know, we get this question a lot, but I want to hear it from you. Yeah, I think we we have Composer in our in our workflow, and what what I think it is important to understand is from an orchestration perspective, that's where. You're, you're looking you're, you're looking for synergies and I think that the orchestration product you can orchestrate in data fusion or CDAP um, but what we're using with the composer implementation is imagine that what I just said to you around all of those API process we're able to do the API processing with our data engineers in composer but then call data fusion to do all of the heavy lifting and moving so if you have you know, the composer orchestrating, you have little pieces that you need to do, little or big, depending on what your use case is, that you need to do with Python or, or whatever your coding is. But then you could tap into Data Fusion to do, again, the heavy lifting. The you, It's really a, a symphony, and orchestration is an excellent word. So we did and we do use that. But I think what we're, what I'm doing with my team, and I have a very lean team, is that in using Composer and Airflow and whatnot, the skill sets you need for that um, versus the GUI based interface and the pipeline migration. When you think about, I need to move to again, Azure, or, you know, I need to move to my own data center. I need to now think about the resources I need, the people, I don't need to do any of that anymore. Like I just have CDAP does all the heavy lifting, connect the pipes. And that's really what works for us. That's incredible. Um, I have another question coming in. Do you use any other clouds other than GCP, Charles? 
Um, no, I will say that for us. I mean, uh, we have a very strong partnership with Google and um, we have, and we've had partnerships with products before, but I think that to be honest, um, we, 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 when you think about hybrid cloud, that's whether that's on-prem or multi-cloud, I think what's important is, you know, what's right fitted for your organization. So we've used other cloud platforms in the past. We're not, um, what I used to coin for the organization or at least our side of the business, coin shy, I mean, cloud shy, we're not that anymore. We're full into the cloud. So I think, you know, that's something, again, my team and us are very considerate of is that, you know, we need to be able to move very quickly because things change. Hmm. Um, I, I know Charles, you touched upon this and I think that also gets into the larger point of, you talked about vendor lock-in and trying to build, but you also mentioned that having this CDAP way is, you can actually, if, if you don't want to use data fusion, you talked about the flexibility. I think, can you elaborate a little bit more what were you thinking you know, with your team and when you, when you made the decision with data fusion and about the lock-in? Yeah, so it's, it's, you, 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 you live and learn, right? And I think that you know, the ETL products we have in place and whatnot, they serve a very valuable purpose. But with technology changing so frequently, when you think of like those products that exist, the maintenance, upgrade, VMs, networking, all of these components are tied behind that product that you now have to maintain. You have to have the resources that know that product all the time. And so really in moving to this open source that is GUI based, plug independent and agnostic to clouds um, and only depend on like VMs and networking and speed, you know, and you could build your own plugins. You just, you can even have Java developers, Python developers in this process. To me, that's a holistic solution versus, you know, again, when I talk about proprietary solutions that, you know, I wouldn't say vent, I, it's vendor locking, but I'm just saying that their products work, but the ecosystem around being able to lift and shift is a lot heavier, right? Because you've got to have all those other concerns um, where we're using, you know, Terraform and whatnot to build these instances. So effectively, if moving, you know, whether we move to our own data centers, because we do have data centers too, uh, of our own, um, we don't have to think about, we just take that Terraform, we build the instance and move our code. And it's just the downtime, you know, the ramp up time and getting in, getting to things can be long. That's onerous. incredible. I think that's awesome. I, I have a very tough question. So this is uh, coming from, I, I mean, there are a lot of questions, but one of the questions is, what is the most painful experience you had with data fusion plugins? I, I would like to hear this from a product management standpoint because we all would like to know. I know we, you have been very <laughs> vocal and, and collaborative with us and telling us what we need to do, but the audience want to hear. Well, I will say this. You can all see my 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 uh, my uh, plugins and issues because it's open on the internet. You could go because I go and I search, and when I see things, I plus one like fix this, fix this. You know, so you know if you want to search for my name, and it's interesting when you post, it says on there your at mob account will be seen. So it's fine with me because it's a problem, and it's not only by me. But um, in terms of versioning, in terms of plugins, I would say you know the versioning is something um, that. I think, you know, in going through this process, when you're going from plugin one to plugin two, I think that, you know, there have been times where, let's say in this plugin, you know, the Java language, you know, called for a particular data type. And then in this one, it got upgraded. And so now like it's looking for a little bit more detail. So now you have to look into that a bit more. So I think the plugin problem is more of like when you're upgrading, that you have to consider what has happened in your workflow. But I think that that's a manageable problem versus the, all the other stuff I just told you, breakage, you know, code, you know, is this a problem? A new database comes out, how do we get that in, involved? Does it support it? So I'd rather deal with plugin versioning issues, I would say, as my worst problem than the other problems. Okay, I, I mean, we have to solve it anyway, and we have been working with you closely. So the other question uh, that came up is, how do you, um, you know, uh, how do you, you know, what do you use for monitoring process for these pipelines, resource utilization, you know? So I think you know, 
because I've talked about the dashboard. And I think that that's a very big window that you guys can solve. Because when you think about the platform as a whole in Data Fusion, you have all the data. You, you know what the pipeline is. You know what's going on. I think and some of your data lineage, and I didn't get a chance to speak about that, you know, the ability to, you know, open up that area, pick a field, and then see all of the different places that are connected to that visually is very important. And we've talked about the evolution that I think that this can have. But right now, the, the process is um, I have BigQuery as my central resource, effectively. I've got... Um, views and data sets monitoring there that tell me about volume, time changes, all kinds of stuff. So I have that. And then in Data Fusion itself, some of that summary data that I showed is helpful. So what ends up happening is that, you know, I'm using portions of Data Fusion where I'm able to see like, you know, all of my pipelines, whether they turn green or red. Um, I'm able to use the timestamps. I'm able to use that information. I go to summaries all within, again, and I, and I will say this, that really sold me, sold me selfishly on Data Fusion was when I was first kind of getting used to the product or seeing what it could do for our solutioning. Um, effectively, I took a weekend, my own weekend, and, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna tackle this. Let's see what's going on. But I did it all from a Chromebook. And that to me is what made me like, okay, I can do this. Because prior to this in my history of working with ETL products or whatever, I'm having to remote into machines. I've got to have the right this, I've got to have the right that. Once you're in a browser and all the compute networking happen, it's on you to be able. So to me, I've been up at 4 a.m. I've done that, I've, I do that. <laughs> so it's like, you know, being able to now imagine if unfortunately you're on vacation and you need to solve a problem. I can go and, you know, when this work from home lifestyle, you know, being able to pull up a browser, as long as all your credentialing is right, you could see a pipeline, fix it, and get into it. So, you know, I kind of went a little bit over there, but I, I think um, hopefully the message is getting across that I think that it's really worked for our decision. I think that is incredible. I, I, you know what? I think you touched upon a very important thing about lineage. Uh, can you explain how the pipeline lineage you have in the product has helped the team? Do you use it internally, or do you also use this to explain what's going on in this data? You know, when the data is getting transformed to your you know, uh, business and other other teams, uh, Charles. How do you use this? Yeah, it, it it depends. I think on the audience. You know, I think some business users. You know, it doesn't matter. Like they're like, hey, I put it in over here. Why is like the multiples of whatever not happening over here? So sometimes it's just more of like, hey, this is running in the background. But for you know my internal teams and whatnot, I have been able to show and again an opportunity. Um, we've discussed in terms of being able to in a dashboard. The, the one thing that doesn't exist right now in a dashboard view is we have a lot of triggers and schedules connected in all across all of our pipelines. I have to manually go in and check each of the pipelines to see what's associated in this, right? What I've had to do outside is maintain, you know, a visual document that tells me sort of like an ER diagram when you think about it, you know, of, of what's connected, what triggers what. But what I'm talking about in the product that's been helpful is if a target on your view lineage, your field lineage area, you can go to a field in your target in a pipeline or in a subset of pipelines and then trace back. And I'll tell you, labeling is important. We, we, we've come up with a nomenclature internally for my team to label the pipelines in a way that helps us know, okay, we put source information in there, we put target information in the label. So it helps us when we're doing field lineage that if there's a problem, we could say, okay, it touches this pipeline, which is these systems. So we need to go there. there. So all of this is in browser, which is very helpful. That's incredible. Um, we had uh, another question. Um, you know, we, are your, you know, do you use, uh, you know, you talked about real time in one of the, you know, earlier thing and, you know, CDC. Um, how frequently are these jobs running? And you did talk about it and saying, you know, batch is also important. Not everything has to be real time. So from, from your standpoint, uh, if you look at your data workloads today, what percentage do you think will go real time and what percentage is still okay with the SLAs that you are doing with, in batch? Yeah, I think um, we're mainly a batch shop, fortunately, because it's tied to baseball games, right? So when you think about it, baseball is on a schedule. 
you know, it starts at this time, ends at this time. It's played every day, so you need to get it done every day. So the reliability, when you think about it, is the most important piece. So I think we're going to be, you know, probably an 80-20 batch shop. But I will say, for example, um, dependent on depending on the event, it would then need to be real time. Let's say for, and again, it's not something we're doing, but let's say all-star, like something related to all-star. It's a one-time event. We might need real-time batch for that product, for that day, or for that weekend, because essentially things are happening, but it's not necessarily needed on all these other processes. So that's where I'm getting at the flexibility of being able to say, and again, I don't know how many people on the call are familiar with CDAP and the diffusion itself, but you know, you 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 could do your namespaces accordingly. So I think having and taking a step back and sort of looking at we separate our namespaces essentially associated to products. So we tie the namespaces to the product so that if we're working on an umpire initiative or a royalty initiative or whatnot, we go into that space and now we can determine are these pipelines needed to be real time? Are these needed to be this without affecting the other stuff, which again, when you think about that ability, it's it's empowering, right? Like versus, you know, my other ETL products where effectively we're trying to find times that like this won't hurt this, or if these streams are running, we got to reduce the load. Like that's not conversations any longer. Yeah. And I think you touched upon another important feature about namespaces, because I know the first time when we met, you were really a big fan of namespaces. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on what does namespaces provide for you and MLB and what is the, what are the benefits that you're seeing with this namespaces? Because this is a very, unique concept that I have seen in my experience in some of the retail products, right? Yeah, so namespaces essentially think of it as with Google, <laughs> another tab, right? So effectively you've got another tab and you're you're on your mob.com and then you have another tab, you're on mob.tv, which are different areas, you know, that you're working on. And what's great about it is, is that the namespaces allows you to segment all of the work that you're doing in that. And I think, the one hurdle or uh, nuance to that is that it's really segmented. Actually, I would say it's more like main browser and incognito in the fact that when you make another namespace, you've got to remanage all of your plugins again because it's truly creating an entirely separate sort of bucket for you to do your work, which is a good and bad thing, right? Like, why do I need, you know, a, a, a MySQL plugin? for this product when this product uses Oracle. Um, and again, I'm just using just random databases, but it's just like, I don't need to have that same plugin on all those databases. Now, um, I think with the namespaces as well, you can get into some of these variableizations per namespaces, that's also important. So what we've also been able to implement is, you call them macros, but you basically put these variables in particular portions of your pipelines that can centrally via namespaces um, be leveraged. So for example, which is, this is very important because of the migrations and things that I'm talking about. So let's say if you have um, a database that's at IP one, and then um, you need to move again, whether it's your ch choice or not, you need to move to a whole other place and move to two. Think about having to go to each pipeline and touch each pipeline over and over and over again, but it's only in one namespace. It's not even across the whole thing you can go at the top line in the namespace and just say IP one, now two, next run, it will all now say two, because again, inherent is the compute profiles that spin up when they're needed. So basically they're just literally workers. They're just like, I gotta go do work. Whatever that work is, let me go do it. As long as the networking is there, I'll just go do the work. So, you know, to me, the empowerment between the namespaces and verbalizations is, a, is, a, is an interesting combo, right? Like it's able to do a lot. That is awesome. I think I think that was because I think it went in. It it, it uh, goes into the next question: Is what kind of planning did you have to do from resource and process scaling? You know, considering the workload, because obviously you might have started slow and then you were scaling, and then uh, you did talk about the ephemeral data prod. I mean, the, the clusters that get spin up, you don't have to worry. And you also talked about namespaces. But can you just walk us through that journey? Um, sure. I think so. Really, I started the product. I start like I said. The weekend, I proved it out, PLC'd myself, sort of saying this can work. And then, you know, I mentioned that I have a lean team. Um, one of my team members moved on. Um, and so what was good about this was the ETL process that I had before, we were in the process of moving to this system. 
in moving to this system with that lean team, we were not, we didn't really lose a beat, right? Because in the, to a degree, the person's very important that they left, but you know, you can't replace people, right? You get, people are important, but all I'm getting at is for the longevity of the enterprise, it's important that you can, can sustain those droughts, you know, of resources and whatnot. So from a resource planning perspective, again, inherent in the process and in planning of doing all of that data lineage and whatnot, it's agnostic a little bit to people. It's more to process now. And, and the resources essentially I would say is people understand data. If you do SQL, if you could do, I would say the minimum is SQL, like understanding SQL, but even that, you know, plugins and stuff like that. When I talk about the self service aspect of this that we want to enable, I want to be able to, and again, this is future, future, future state. I want to be able to go to a business user in an app and say, you, you see this button, hit this button. Data will do everything else will work in the background. Don't yeah. worry about it. Hit that button and data will move. That to me will empower them to not call me at 2 a.m. to say, hey, I need this to move over, right? I, or I need it sooner. I need it sooner. And so if they need it sooner, they, but that's the future. That's the future. That's incredible. I had another question, like, you know, what were, like, you know, this is also going back, you know, to what were some of the tools that you have used in the past before, um, you know, you got into data fusion? Because one of the questions that they were asking is, was there any lineage tool that you were using or were you using any other data integration technologies out there not that you don't um, think you're like you know yeah i don't i don't want to go into names per se no, no. I, yeah i don't want to go into names but we were using a number of, of products i'll just say overall you know and i think that you know it's all the stuff that that's out there whether it be kafka whether it be you know investigating like you said airflow or whether it's investigating like you know um those are open source versions so that's why i mentioned that you know so it's yeah. just more of like you know we, we're in the space heavy um and we effectively use a number of products so I'd say that. No, that's great. Um, the uh, let me see. Um, can you like you know? Can you? I think there was one uh, question about macros. Uh, can you tell us uh, uh, your experience around leveraging macros for like kind of around security, security management, and things like that? Yeah, you know, the, it's interesting. Again, because we have to, we've had to spin up multiple. When you upgrade or the previous process for upgrading. We've been with this since six, what? I want to say six one or whatnot. Yeah. So the previous process with that one was where you had to literally spin up a whole new instance, right? And in spinning up a whole new instance, you then have to port and migrate all of your pipelines over, which again is the opportunity that I think you guys have. Some of the feedback I gave you guys, and then you worked on it, was enabling a button. You hit upgrade, all of it's managed now. Like I just hit a button, everything goes through, and there's better, there's stuff better for that. Um, the macro component when it comes to security that's empowering is especially around passwords, I would say. So what's great about this is that with the macro management, you can put your passwords and whatnot into that same process I said before where you need to change you know, IP one to two. Um, what you would do is you would put, you'd label it password one, just a general. So when I have a data engineer or another person coming in, I would just say to them, here's the variable for that password for that database. And they wouldn't even know. They just know it's this one. I just put it in, keep moving forward, and I have access. So that's also very powerful with the macros. Oh, that's incredible. So you are actually doing governance also, ensuring that not everybody needs the password. They don't have to see the password. There might be some systems that nobody needs access to. But they yeah. can still continue doing their work. Yes. Oh, that's incredible. Um, you know, the other question that came up was um, resource and process scaling. So you talked about, I don't have to worry about it, you know, what workloads today, you know. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more in the sense that, because I think, you know, in, in, in the traditional world, you had to plan for what kind of workloads you're going to run. Yeah. If it's going to be 100 gigs or tomorrow it's going to be terabyte, then you have to think about scaling. And so what... Like, you know, do you have, what kind of planning did you go through or do you have to worry about it? Is it on your, you know, on your mind all the time? So I'm, I, I'm gonna try to summarize that. Um, and so what I would say is this, prior, prior to this, the planning really had to deal with mostly um, resources around, con um, you know, it hitting other jobs, right? Like, you know, if I have this running, this box is 64 gigs or whatever you might have it. And effectively like 
the data that I'm running through here, because I'm running through this box, you know, I've got to manage all of this data and what times they're moving. I think when, when we move to this effectively, um, the management now moves to the level of compute profiles you're using. And we've talked about that, um, uh, you know, our conversations around the management of that. We've had to make multiple compute profiles for multiple scenarios. And that necessarily is the planning we've done. So let's say we have one that's, you know, you know, has two worker nodes, you know, it's 50 gigs, you know, two terabytes. We've got another compute profile that's, you know, um, you know, 64 gigs, 80 workers, you know, you know, 50 terabytes, whatever you want to do. What I'm getting at is that we figured out that we needed to have the varying compute profiles to necessarily manage the speed and throughput of the data going from wherever it's coming from to where it's landing. And so by building all these compute profiles, we could tap in to say, we basically throttle up and down because we're batch saying, okay, this process, you know, four hours is even sooner than what they used to do. They used to get the data in a week. Now we're able to give it to them in four hours. Let's, you know, use a cheaper compute profile. This one, it needs to move a lot more records and they need to get it in the next two hours. Let's use this compute profile. And I, and I get the conversations we've had is around, I don't want to be in a compute profile business, <laughs> you know, to be fair, I don't want to be in that business. I've had, I've, I was in it for a little too long and I want you or you folks at Google or the CDAP community necessarily to manage that. And I think we've talked about the opportunity to necessarily, you tell me like, Hey, and that's where the recommendation engineering sort of kind of comes in is that I see over the last hundred runs, there's been this much data pulling through. It's going to cost X. Do you need it to go faster? Do you need to go slower? And that's, the relationship I'd rather have. And when move, and I'll tell you this, I, I, we didn't talk about it before, but I'll tell you on this call, is that um, I know that might be proprietary necessarily in terms of recommendation entry, but it would be great if you could attach the profiles you end up using or that I sl they solve to move with me. Because at least that way, the yeah. tools and options that you've already, I've chosen and said, I want option number eight. Option number eight, at least as part of my exports, come with me. So again, you know, I'm not leaving you, but I'm just right now. Like, yeah, you don't have to be future resistant, right? Like you, we got to work together to make a, a a better product. No, absolutely, absolutely, Charles. I think we see this as our opportunity. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the feedback that you've given us. Uh, the other question that this is a very, very important question, and I know we have talked about it in in a numerous conversations since last year. You and I. Uh, how do you, you know? Uh, Two parts to it. One is pipeline failures. How do you handle it? I know it has been, you know, there are there is a huge opportunity over there. And then the second part of the question is, what kind of data quality test you need to do to ensure that the data that you are producing at the end of your pipeline is consumable to your or, or it's relevant for your business? Yeah, I think I think that's very apt um, for the conversation, and I think to kind of go through it, it a little bit. Um, Pipeline failures, how do we handle pipeline failures? I think just like everyone else, in terms of like you're investigating logs and that's what I talked about with, I think there's an opportunity from a logging perspective that you guys could surface more information. There was a problem that we had, and again, you can find the ticket, it's public, um, where um, there was an issue that effectively we needed to go to one of your senior engineers to find what the problem was. And it was deep in a, in a log text somewhere on the target system that basically was saying that there was a problem that I wasn't seeing on my system. And so when the engineer was able to see that, they were able to tell me, hey, there's an object that's type X that's giving a problem. And I was like, how would I know that? And then it was like, I understand that that's on the the the, the other side, not our side. And so we worked together to be able to, to do that. But that's where I talk about with, with logging being an opportunity for enhancements. And I think that the, the view raw logs, again, logging is important. Um, and in terms of quality, data quality, I think that um, just like everything else, you know, in the pipeline management, one of the things, again, working with the service team, uh, you guys, like if I had a problem with a pipeline, I, you know, didn't know what was going on. I submitted a ticket and one of the suggestions was around the error collector and the alerting. So I was able to, if there's errors in your pipeline, you can actually manage it. And that's the, you know, the future proofing of the product of where effectively the pipeline will fail 
but it will dump the errors necessarily maybe into its own workflow. Maybe I have that, you know, whether you chain it together or you have it dump into, you know, buckets or whatnot, you figure that out for your use case. But um, that's how we would be able to, you know, manage the pipeline quality or as well as we also, I mean, just like everybody else, we check, you know, you're, you're looking at source information, you're looking at volume of data, you're looking at data types. And I will say, you know, landing in BigQuery, you know, whether you use, you know, other products that are similar to BigQuery, landing it there at the same place. I mean, isn't that what, you know, BI and data is, right? You know, landing it in one place, doing the work and whatnot, and you're reviewing those data types, seeing if, you know, you're missing anything. I mean, that's also some of the stuff that I've, again, opportunity for you with dashboards. But for me, I've had to build my own analytics that tell me the volume that's moving across, which tables are being affected. And that is what I use to see like, okay, if I'm expecting 650 million, I'm seeing 650 million, I go to the table that's over there. And then, you know, you do your spot checks and whatnot. But there's automation also, it, opportunities there too. That's incredible. There was another question. I think there are two parts to it. I'll give you the second part. First part I can answer. I think the question is around uh, data flow um, and ETL work based on data fusion. So I think I think you know on, on this question, what I wanted to say is, data fusion doesn't have a processing engine. Data fusion, yeah. um, you know, data fusion leverages data product today as processing. But what we are looking at is, you know, data flow is another scalable processing framework that we have for streaming analytics, uh, which is based on Apache Beam. Um, on the data proc, actually, data fusion uses Spark based processing, so we we leverage data proc. We are also enhancing our product to execute completely on BigQuery. That means BigQuery can become an execution engine. You can also run this on your, like Seed app doesn't run, you can run it on data proc, but you can also run it outside um, uh, outside of data proc. So the, the, the thing is, the main thing is, data fusion is completely dissociated from the execution framework. So the way we look at data flow is, data flow is an API based, massively scalable framework to do data processing, similar to Spark, and even BigQuery can do that. Data Fusion, think of it as, you know, the benefits that you are going to get, I think Charles has mentioned this is, how do you actually accelerate, you know, to, to ensure that the data actually is processed in a way uh, and gets into the hands of business to make critical decisions? And I think that's where Data Fusion comes into play. Um, so uh, think of it as, you know, uh, the, the way I'm going to, you know, in the future, what you will see is data fusion will run wherever you want. And depending on the SLAs, it will process data on Spark or data proc or data flow or BigQuery, depending on your SLAs. And you don't have to worry where you are processing. So data flow and data uh, fusion are not products that are competing. Data flow is a framework that allows you to process data at massively at scale like Spark and data fusion sits on top of it. So with that, I think Charles, I wanted to ask you a question. I think this is something that you know you mentioned, right? Uh, you we are agnostic to processing. So can you outline like you know uh, benefits of data fusion generally, uh, you know, from the processing? Because you could have done all these things in Python. You could have done yes. written Java code, which your team is extremely we familiar did. with, right? So, we do. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, what you what you're getting towards is like when you're talking about those other products of data flow, and even when people are talking about Airflow, you know, that's one of the things I've even stressed with my team. You know, finding the right balance between the products to know right fit and, and, and resources. We, we've used data flow to move data across, but there's again, you know, that's when you, when you think about data flow too, like um, they have templates as well. You, you tap into their templates, you do all of that stuff. It's just limiting in terms of all of the, I think the plugins is a great solution, right? Like the, the, the templates are like plugins, but I get to pick a whole bunch of different, you know, because I, I will tell you this, I moved data with data flow one, at one point, um, and then I started getting er errors with JDBC drivers. Now, again, I, lean team, I need to get this stuff going. I don't want to have to debug JDBC connections and do all that kind of stuff. Like, I think at the end of the day, it's like, where do you want to live? And to me, I would prefer to abstract all of that, let that be managed somewhere, and then just do the work that's needed for the solutioning which is you know, app the, the app process of moving data along, the targeting for where it needs to go, the organization. There's a lot of work there. I mean, how many of you 
who are on this call with data engineering. You're spending so much cleaning and doing this, but then on top of that, you're adding JDBC driver investigation and data. I mean, you don't want to do all of that, right? Like, so, you know, I think, again, it's a great product. I've used it. It's just as fast. It moves just as fast, right? Because it's all on the Spark base, but you're right that it's it's abstracted from that. And that's why I say about the compute profiles, just workers, you know, sending instructions and just for the data product to just go forward. I think that's incredible. I think I think I think we are um, out of questions. I think we are good. Uh, so Charles, I wanted to like you know touch uh, on the last thing. Two things. Uh, one is, um, is there like where do you see this data journey going to go uh, from an MLB standpoint in the future? I think that's one question I wanted to ask you. Um, I mean, the data 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 journey is all encompassing. I mean, my our team gets involved. Like I said, behind the scenes, you know. There's other folks, as I mentioned, the MLB TV, the tickets, there's so many different areas of the business. Um, and what's been great is the enablement of our team, again, with our infrastructure folks, all our networking guys, there are people on our side who have helped us through this journey, get all this stuff set up. But as it's set up now, you know, sky's the limit when you talk about, I'm, I'm not kidding, like somebody comes in and they're like, hey, we have this new project, we need to do this. It's spinning up another namespace and, you know, connect, 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 and then there you go, here's your data. And I think from a, from a future perspective, it's just taking on more projects, unfortunately. My team is on here, just taking on more projects. Um, but the delivery necessarily is into the integrations into the items that Google have, to be fair. So one of the things that we love is that landing things in Google Sheets makes it a much more collaborative environment, right? So I think that, you know, I did mention on the plugins, I think the Google Sheets is important because we do want to empower our business users. We want them to, when they're invested, it's important, right? Like if that conversation of just like, hey, I put $2 here and it's manipulated and it's 10 bucks over here. When they're invested and they write that information or they have a hand in that, they understand they grow and we're all finding those opportunities. So I think that, you know, it's more projects, but it's also, you know, more efficient solutions for the enterprise as a whole, which is at the end of the day, you know, helping business, helping our business, helping youth, helping everyone. That's awesome. I think, I think that's a perfect uh, ending. I think I, uh, you know, um, I just wanted to, I can't uh, express our sincere gratitude. I think, you know, customers like you, especially professionals like you are helping our products make better. Uh, we have invested heavily into CDAP and we are only, we, I, I think Google is the biggest sponsor of CDAP and we are actually bringing in all this open source into data fusion and we, we can't thank you enough. I think we have done some great collaborative work. I look forward to like 20, rest of 2021 and 2022 so that you drive us and you push us hard to actually do the right thing for everybody. Because I think the things that we have done together, I know every single person who is asking those questions, they're like, yes, I know it. So. Thank you, Charles. Uh, thank you for your time. Re realize um, that you're but, on you're on record. <laughs> yes, <laughs> fixing yes, all of absolutely. these things. By the way, so I am expecting them. So you know, other people are asking. I'm asking. So now you know we gotta fix you. You gotta fix it, but you know I'm gonna use it. That's really what <laughs> yes, it is, right? Yes. And one last thing, I want to sure. get a picture of both of us so that we can remember. And if you can smile. And thanks a lot for everybody for tuning in. We'll have another session like this. Um, somebody like you know uh, MLB and Charles who's going to explain their, their journey with CDAP and Data Fusion in, in the next quarter. But thanks a lot for joining today. Thank, appreciate you. Thank it. you for having us. We appreciate you know the the diligence and you know it's a from where it was to even where it is now um, has been great. You know learning curves and whatnot all encompassing. But we've discussed this. I think it can go you know, clearly I've discussed and I'm talking about it, it can go a lot farther. So, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for this too. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Over to you, Alma and the team.